On this fabulous Friday morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, and we know he's an Admiral because it says so on his jacket. Good morning, Billy. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, look at this nice jacket that uh, that I was uh, was given. Uh, gifted. Gifty, gifty. Yeah, the uh, yeah. the other co-host got one as well, but this is especially nice. The Admiral made a donation of a half a million dollars to the Hornby <laughs> Foundation, and uh, was uh, given that jacket in exchange. Yeah. yeah. So it's the most expensive very expensive jacket. jacket. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very expensive <laughs> jacket. It's a, some call it a boondoggle. We just call it a donation. Yeah. But, but probably a good swap. Both of us benefited a great deal. I think you came out ahead, Bill. That's uh, that's worth the money. <laughs> well, ask Hornby. See what he says. He'd probably rather have the jacket back than those few few dollars. But money is nothing to him. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was expecting to see David Robinson. I saw the jacket. David Robinson. The Admiral. The, He's the, the Admiral. Admiral. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking you're going back with that reference, JB. Yeah. Right? JB McCuskey is our guest here in this first segment, swinging through the panhandle. JB, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, guys. How are you all today? We're doing great. How's your How's your cold doing? It's you and I sound like uh, twins. Uh, you know, it's a cold. It, 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 for whatever reason, these things seem to last longer than they used to. Uh, I don't know if it's because I have too little, too little germ carrying children at the house, or yeah. How old are you? Little uh, six and eight. I got a kindergartner and a third grader. Yeah, I w- I think I was healthy for about ten straight years until we had uh, our first children, and then from that point forward, you're just sick for twenty years. Yeah, it's true because <laughs> they bring home everything. <laughs> they do right. And, they, and it doesn't ever affect them. I yeah, mean, they get sick for like two hours, and then you're you know sick what? for like three weeks. Because they take, they take their hands, and they stick them in their mouths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So every germ known to man winds up in a kid's mouth, and then they get immune to them. Yeah. Yeah. They just pass them on to you. You know why? Because you wash your hands. That's right. And your kid doesn't. <laughs> so, I am so healthy that I'm unhealthy. Yes, yeah. that's the problem. That's it's, it's you got to stop washing your hands, that's James. Right. You got to quit exercising and eating right. It's, that's right. Yeah, the, all of that's dumb. So, yeah. so this is going to be a know your local hygiene, know your personal that's hygiene right. program this morning. You yeah. either wash your hands all the time or don't wash them at all. This in between, sometimes once in a while stuff, it just kills enough germs to keep you on the edge of getting new ones. That and thirty year old basketball references. Yeah, I love that though. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, the Admiral. Yeah. San Antonio had quite a run there. Yeah. Tim Duncan, David Robinson. That's where my wife's run, too. She's from San Antonio? She is. It's an amazing city. Was it the uh, River Walk? Is that oh, what yeah. the uh, and area there is? More military than any place in America. It, it, it is a truly fantastic city. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Excellent. What brings you to the Panhandle today? All kinds of stuff. Um, but but mostly, we are we are meeting with as many prosecutors and sheriffs as we can um, for a bunch of reasons. But, you know, one of the biggest is that the attorney general's office has uh, a very unique set of authority that that helps us, um, that can help us uh, bolster how our sheriffs and, and prosecutors are. And, and I'm somebody, I'm a constitutional conservative who believes in the, the, the most local control is, is the best. And the attorney general's office can be a huge support staff um, for our prosecutors and sheriffs, and I'm meeting with them all over the state. I think we met with uh, four prosecutors yesterday and three sheriffs, and we're meeting with a couple more on the way home um, just to get a great idea of, of, of how it is that we can do everything we can to support our law enforcement officers and our uh, and our prosecutors. Did you meet with uh, Katie here in uh I did. She's fantastic. Yeah. And and a candidate for judge now, too. She is. So I can't say too much more about being a candidate for judge changes things a lot. But Katie Mm -hmm. has been a friend a long time. And and she is one of the more respected prosecutors in West Virginia. When you when you go to Clay, Calhoun, you name the county that is isn't very close to Berkeley. uh, Katie is 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 way up on their list of people that they look to for guidance. to. I presume you met with Matt Harvey. I have met with Matt Harvey, and uh, we had a we had a great chat last evening too about the uh, West Virginia First Foundation. Matt is the chair of that of that foundation, which is an incredible honor and really a great thing for the Eastern Panhandle. Um, and there's another set of opportunities that we have as a state to turn around decades of of a problem that has, quite frankly, changed the trajectory of our state in a way that is not good. And and I think that foundation and the people on it. Um, especially with leadership like Matt's, will be a huge first step to making sure this never happens again. Now, Matt co-hosts on Thursdays here. Just Thursdays? Yeah. So, sometimes, you know, I think he sat in last Friday, too, but sometimes uh, other well, days. Well, his but... last, t- was it 
Yeah, last last Tuesday I was thinking as well. He, he's busy. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned working with the uh, uh, the prosecuting attorneys. Uh, your opponent, Mike Stewart, at one time was suggesting that uh, that his office should take over a lot of the functions of the local prosecuting attorney. I think he's backed off on that. But have you heard him say that? Did you hear him say that? He has backed off on yeah. most of that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Um, I like to do my own thing. Yeah. And and so my office now, the state auditor's office, we have prosecutorial authority. And we created something called the Public Integrity and Fraud Unit uh, when I started. And we have prosecuted, I believe the number is 46 felony fraud convictions in the last six years. Um, but we didn't prosecute them ourselves. While we could have, um, we have taken the tact from the very beginning that it is our job to support our prosecutors and to to give them the resources they need to do a great job in these cases. And, and occasionally they'll ask us to actually do it, right? But we don't do it on our own. And the reason is, is because our prosecutors, they know the defendants, they know the judges, they know the grand juries, they know the jurisdictions. Um, and we are really, really great at building the case, uh, providing the, the accounting services, the forensic accounting, you name it. Um, and then letting letting the, the prosecutor who was elected by the people in that jurisdiction do the, do the, uh, do the prosecution has worked great for me and my team. And, you know, to be fair, when we've been asked to actually step in and do the prosecution, we are undefeated as well. And, and so I, I see the relationship in the AG's office very similarly. Is a, is a constitutional divide between the uh, a local prosecuting attorney and the attorney general? Because I, I noticed there's a, uh, with the current attorney general, uh, Patrick Marcy, there have been a couple of instances local that he is tr- that he's appeared to want to get more involved than what he should have been. Is there a clear constitutional division between, between the two? Yeah, there's a very clear constitutional division, and, and I, I can't comment on anything yeah. that's no, happened and I, in, I wasn't in the asking past. You to no, I, yeah. um, but, you know, the, the idea is the attorney general's office has a lot of uh, functionality in the appeal process. So when there's writs and there are uh, habeas petitions and, and things of that nature, the attorney general's office will very, very frequently um, have to step in. And that becomes significantly more difficult when you were involved in the original prosecution. Um, and so that's one of the reasons. But the other is that we have probably 300 prosecutors and assistant prosecutors throughout the state. I don't think we need any more. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't seen some great issue within our, our prosecution our, or our prosecutorial environment in West Virginia where we need another set of those people. Um, I, I have the full faith and trust in our in the system as it is now, and we're really looking forward to building a government a local government services team in the attorney general's office to support those folks as much as we can. And what is the size of the attorney general's office? The attorney general's office is, I mean, it's its relatively big and it buoys up and down. It, it's probably a little bit bigger than the auditor's office. Um, I haven't actually gone in and looked at the, sure. the exact numbers recently. Uh, it's pretty easy to pull up on the West Virginia checkbook site. Mm-hmm. Uh, for anybody out there listening, if you want to hold your government accountable, just go to wvcheckbook.gov. Um, but, you know, the, it is, it's a similar sized agency to be managed. Um, and... That's, at the end of the day, probably the single biggest part of being the attorney general yeah. is building a team of people that trust you, trust your vision, um, and are willing to go to work every day um, to make West Virginia a better place. Now that you're ending your time as auditor at the end of this year, uh, you had, and you've done a lot of good things. It's, uh, it's very obvious uh, your accomplishments. Is there something or some things that you did not have time to get around to that you wish you had addressed? Yeah, I, I think that there are a couple things that uh, that would have really, really been game changing for the entire state bureaucracy. So one of the things that we focused on a lot was. In places where we can simplify and unify systems, we need to we need to get the government to start to do that. Um, we had a bill last session called the Prompt Pay Act, and it didn't pass. Uh, and we're hoping that it might pass this time. But that's a this would be a good example of that. So we're going to work to get that bill across the line this time too. But what it does is it says if the government doesn't pay 
a an invoice that's owed to one of its contractors, there's a percentage that is added on to what the government has to pay. Because what we found is is that several uh, our bureaucracy is so big and so bloated that the agencies will occasionally lose invoices or just not have the cash flow to pay them. And if you're a you know a gravel contractor in Clay County, West Virginia, and the you know the government owes you 1.2 million dollars for gravel you delivered seven months ago, you can't pay your people. Right. And so there, there is an inherent unfairness in in the government keeping these invoices for so long. It makes everything cost more. It makes vendors less likely to bid on things. Um, and so just the, the totality of reforming the whole um, government payment system to make it faster and easier. Um, we're not quite there yet. We have done an enormous amount of work. The audit process is like 350% faster than it was when I started. Um, but we still need to really refine our process to make sure we're taking care of our local businesses, taking care of the people that do the work um, for the state. In this age of technology, it seems like tech, technology can address a lot of things. Is technology available or is a tool to track when payments should be made? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's sort of the point, right, is that uh, we've provided all of the resources that are needed to do this properly. Now it's really a matter of mindset. Um, and, you know, we were able to, ch to sort of shift this mindset in my office. So when, when I, since I've started, we are about 20% smaller in personnel and about 25% smaller in general revenue budget. But we're doing a thousand more audits. Our audit time is down 300%. Um, we've added the public integrity and fraud unit. Like I said, we have um, incredible results when it comes to dilapidated buildings. Uh, we've reformed the entire land sale process. We've done all of these things, right, while making our office both smaller in personnel and smaller in expense. Uh, and interestingly enough, we've also returned over $100 million back to the general revenue just in the seven years that I've been there. And so when you're looking at how do we make our bureaucracy a, a smaller, more efficient, uh, more focused thing, right? I, I, you, have to, you have to look to people that have done it before, and I have. And it really is about mindset. I mean, if you look, if you sit down on the first day of the office you're in and you say, look, I think we can do this better, faster, for less money, and we're going to refocus our efforts on the things that matter the most, this is the result, right? Yeah. Going back to Attorney General's office, uh, and I don't want to uh – I'm not. This question is not meant to criticize, not meant to uh, uh, throw stones at anybody. But looking, looking at the office now, are there some fundamental shifts that you think that you would try to implement once you're elected? There are no fundamental shifts. Okay. Um, you know, Patrick has done a really great job in that office. He has turned it, uh, maybe most importantly, into a place where truly great lawyers want to work and. The ability to attract top talent is as important in the attorney general's office as it is at WVU's basketball team, right? If you have the best players, you're going to have the best team. And and so when... As long as the NCAA clearinghouse approves the uh, you, Correct, <laughs> yes. As, as long as you're... Um, God, I mean, we can get into that in a second. Um, what a disaster for those kids. But um, as long as you are bringing in the best lawyers in the world you're going to be able to lead the country on the things that need to be led on. And we're not done with that stuff yet, right? Patrick absolutely led on Waters of the United States and uh which benefited us here yeah. locally. Oh, I mean it was it was an insanely important case, right? And then on the EPA case, yeah. it, I mean he he has fundamentally changed the the way that the regulatory environment in Washington is allowed to interact with with states that they don't particularly like, and we are one of those states that the regulatory environment in Washington doesn't particularly like. Um, but we're not done yet. There's things called like the Chevron Doctrine, um, Chevron Deference, actually, is what it's called. That, I was that, just discussing that last night with my wife because she works at the FDA. So this is timely that you bring this. Yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, and, and and when West Virginia has the ability to for for states from around the country to say, look, these guys are this is a great place for us to file these lawsuits from, right? These guys have first class lawyers, but they're also a, the perfect representation of what happens when a rogue federal bureaucracy tries to stop the progress of a uh, a state that makes its living doing something that they don't like. Um, and so Patrick has really done a great job of doing that. And so do, do we need to have a fundamental change? Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Are, are there things that I 
or that I want to accomplish personally that might be a little different than what's happened over the last eight or 10 years? Of course. Right. I mean, that's the reason why we have elections. Um, but I think all of those things are going to be easier for me to accomplish because of the reputation that that office has now. JB, you're one of the most prominent Republicans in the state. So I'd like to hear you weigh in on this discussion going on right now within the party to close the primary to just Republicans and eliminate independents or others uh, from voting in the Republican primary. So I'll say this. I'm not on the committee and uh, I'm going to leave it to them to do this work. It's up to the committee. But I'll tell you, uh, I'm going to win my election one way or the other. So, you know, I'm not sitting around waiting on bated breath on, on what the decision is. And, and the second thing I would say is that we all it, as I'm a registered Republican. I've been a Republican since I registered when I was 18 years old and I campaign as a Republican. I campaign to Republicans. And if independents see my message and hear me and want to and, and believe in my vision for West Virginia, I love it when they vote for me. But I am a Republican. Um, and so that's the decision that's going to have to be made is do we want um, do we want independents to listen to our message and decide whether or not they want to vote for us? Or do we want people to have to register to Republican to come in and vote for us? And that's a decision that the, the committee is going to have to make. But, you know, from my standpoint, I am incredibly confident in, in, in my election one way or the other because I'm a Republican and I campaign to Republicans. I fundamentally prefer that a Republican Party nominates its candidate from Republican Party voters. That makes the most sense to me. Um, West Virginia has a large independent registration. I think part of that is because they can vote in the primary of the other party. I think once you eliminate that, then it forces people to pick a party, which I don't think is a bad thing. Uh, so, But one thing I would not like to see, though, is on this short of notice, I would not like to see them enact it for this election cycle. It does feel do. very, very close to the election. And it also seems like it's happening after the filing period started. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's fair to those who have uh, already registered as a, in a party and to the clerks who are going to have to oversee this administration. There's probably some counties that have already printed ballots, too, if I had to guess. But yeah. just, to, just a counterpoint to, to what you just said. So when we implemented the checkbook, right, um, I knew I wanted the counties and cities to be on it. And... You know, we had a discussion and there was people in my office who said, well, we should just make them be on it. You're allowed to make them be on it. You can say you have to use the checkbook. And I said, look, I think it's probably better if we give it to them and let them decide, like not make them do it, because I feel like 50 willing participants is way better than 55 unwilling participants. And and you just what you just said sort of sparked that in my brain. You know, you, you said we would be forcing people to pick a party. I don't know that uh, that I think I would rather people choose to be Republican. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, again, I'm not arguing one way or the other about closing the primary, but mm -hmm. the idea that we would be forcing somebody to be a Republican as opposed to them coming to us willingly because of our if they mission. if they wanted to vote in the primary, they would have to correct choose, is what I meant. They're, yeah, yeah. But you, you understand my point, yeah. though. I think our party will grow and we will have a better set of Republicans when they come and register to be a Republican, not because they have to to vote in the primary, but because they say, I believe in limited government. I believe in freedom. I believe in constitutional conservatism. I believe in being pro-life. I believe in the Second Amendment, right? And they say, this is the party that is going to make sure that those freedoms are protected for me and my family, um, as opposed to saying, if you're not a Republican, you can't vote in our primary. I would much rather, because I think they will stay Republican longer. I think they will get more active in Republican politics, and I think that they will be better members of our party if they come because of our actions, not because of um, the, the mandatory registration so, for a so primary. It, if I could read between the lines, it sounds like you'd rather they didn't pass this resolution no, on Saturday. I actually, it, it, I, I'm going to let them do it one way or the other. What I'm saying is I don't like that argument for that side. Mm -hmm. I don't like I don't like saying we need to close the primary because it'll make people become Republicans. I don't. I don't think that's a very good argument. The best argument is that if it's a Republican primary, Republicans should be picking the candidate. That is 
the best argument. And that's my argument. Yes. Which is, it's if it's the Republican Party, the Republican Party registered voters should be the ones who pick the Correct. candidate, not somebody else, Bill. But uh, how do you de- how do you describe or identify a Republican? What we're talking well, how about. How you registered. Well, no, no, no. I think it's a lot more than that. Uh, I heard John Overton the other day discuss this on uh, one of the other networks. And John was taking this argument with the purity of thought. We, we have Republicans. They feel that. If this goes through, I bet practically everybody that's Russian independent is going to shift. And the vast majority of them are going to shift to the Republican Party, the mm-hmm. Republican Party, because that's where the action is. That does not say that their attitude or their philosophy is going to change with them. They're going to keep their same attitude, same philosophy that they had been using as an independent. But now they're being labeled, and they had to be labeled as a Republican. So I, I don't buy this that we're going to keep keep it within the party for the purity of the philosophy, because I think that's going to be delivered looted because these folks are going to shift over for convenience. Well, it's the reason why in the 90s and probably before so many people registered Democrat in West Virginia because if you wanted to have a exactly. say in the vote, you registered to vote in the primary. That's right. And today is even more so than what it was back in the 80s and 90s uh, because the Republican Party literally has a chokehold mm-hmm. on the political process. JB, what are you watching in the West Virginia legislature this 60-day session? Uh a lot of stuff, but we, we are real keen on watching the budget. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time creating resources for legislators to be able to follow the budget and to be able to break down what agencies and bureaucracies are telling them in a way that enables them to hold them accountable. Um, you can go on the checkbook site, like I talked about before, and the entire current state budget, as it's being argued, is broken down by department and line item for everyone to see publicly. And it will change as those numbers change throughout the legislature. And so we are um, constantly training legislators on how to really understand the budget, really understand where the money is going and why different line items are are shifting up and down. Um, And so for us, you know, the, the biggest thing that we're watching is how do we continue to, um, to hold our budget either flat or smaller and start to really demand better results from from the bureaucracy. Let me relay very quickly a text I just received from one of the senior officials in Berkeley County. He says, JB has done a great job with technology. We need more state elected officials that embrace the technology like he has. So you have at least one. Hey, one there we go. Yeah. I love it. Was that Gary Wine by chance? It was Gary See, Wine I, by chance. <laughs> Sorry, Gary. I had to, <laughs> Rob called you out. I there. outed him. He's but, like, I texted you for yeah. a reason. <laughs> yeah, but but me, Gary knows technology. So. Let me ask you a philosophical question yeah. here, JB. And this is uh, the movement that has grown over the last couple of years to identify uh, "quote unquote" rhinos in the Republican Party, <laughs> Republican in name only, uh, and that that definition and the identity of that has has shifted uh, from almost a week to week as to who qualifies as a rhino or who doesn't qualify as a rhino. And uh, I think I'm 60, I'll be 61 January the 30th. So I've been a registered Republican. You don't Republican. look a day over 59, man. You know, I don't feel it either. Yeah, That's the look, truth. Yeah. Uh, but I've been a registered Republican for 40-something years. And I I think this movement is so unhealthy for the Republican Party. This, this, this self-appointed, pure cream of the Republican crop who are going around saying you don't vote purely enough, you're not a real Republican, we don't we don't want you. I think this is a great way to kill the whole big tent idea that Ronald Reagan used to throw out there. We're trying to narrow this party down to such a small, it's like Steve Martin and the jerk. You can have any prize between this shelf and this shelf, between here and there, between there and there. So there's such a small box of who's a real Republican or not. It's ultimately the death of the party. Well, first of all, thank you for bringing up The Jerk. It's one of the best movies of all time. Don't shoot the cans. He hates those um, cans. <laughs> uh, I don't really think labeling people is almost ever a really good idea. Uh, I think that there's nuance in politics. And when you're trying to determine who and why you, you're voting for someone, there aren't – most people, I think – are very, very keen to understand who the person is, too, right? And the idea that that we are both wanting to close our primary only to let Republicans like vote in the primary, which, like I said before, 
might be a great idea. And that the, the committee's going to understand that. But then also segmenting off a whole other portion of the people who are already Republicans and label them as something that is Republican adjacent or whatever, that doesn't make sense in concert together. Right. Those two things are actually in in extreme competition with each other. And so if we're going to decide that we want to be that if you want to be part of our primary, you have to be part of our party. I think we're going to have to start probably, like you said, spending a little less time labeling people in the party who very frequently are very conservative. And there's, um, you know, time is time is a long time. And and the issues and what's important in the in the moment changes frequently, uh, but the core principles of believing that the the words of the Constitution say what they say, and that allowing people and families to live in as much freedom as humanly possible, and, you know, as long as we're we are staying to those core tenets. That the the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, has this incredible little speech where he talks about the seven core principles of conservatism. And I would encourage everyone to go look at that. Um, And and he he has it on the internet and it's easy to find. But they're very, very simple things, right? They are, how do we tax you the absolute least possible? How do we allow you to live in the most freedom possible? How do we make sure that you can worship in the ways that you believe you should be? And how do we ensure that your children are being educated? These are, you know, these very simple core conservative principles that all at the end of the day come down to this inalienable rights that were handed down to us by God that are protected by a document that was created by the greatest group of political philosophers of all time. Um, And which is what has enabled us to be the greatest country in the history of the world. And there's a lot of people in Washington who don't believe any of those seven anymore. And so we we have to, I think, start to look at ourselves, especially in West Virginia, and say, look, how many other states have this many conservative people all together? Right? It's gonna make it's going to work a lot better if we work together to make sure the state this state stays conservative and stays the place where young families are gonna to want to move, as opposed to ostracizing people because they might be in ninety five percent as opposed to a hundred. Where are you headed next? Uh we are headed to Hagerstown to do TV, uh, and then I'm going to go meet the new sheriff uh, here in Berkeley County. So we'll be back. Um, nice. Sheriff uh, Blair, Ron correct? Blair, yeah. Who I, is not related to Craig. No, no. And is from Southern West Virginia, correct? I, I thought Rob was from around here. I, I don't his, know. I know his wife's family. I think, yeah, I think Rob's from around here as well. Oh, well, I have heard of nothing but great things, and I'm really yeah. excited to meet with him and and. You know, our office does a lot of work with the sheriffs. Uh, We do a lot of trainings with the sheriffs. We help them mostly with tax collection um, side of their office. But um, I'm really, really excited to get to meet him because I've heard that he is just a fantastic guy. As a sidebar on that, his wife, Mary Beth, is probably as active in the community for the betterment of the community as anybody I know. It's the very, the very. A lot of energy. A lot of, a lot of energy. But I got to meet Joe Kinzer yesterday, too. Oh, yeah, Joe's a great guy. We had a great conversation. Joe's from Wheeling. um, And so we got to talk a little bit about hockey, which uh, was really fun. So Yeah, the Nailers. The wheel, the, yes, who are the, uh, I think, the, the second level baby pens, if yeah, I remember correctly. Exactly. Uh, someone yeah. said Rob's from Huntington. Huntington. Is he from Huntington? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Which I, is I, south I, of here. You're right, then, JB. Yeah, there hey, we go. Have a great day. Hey, thanks, guys. You'll-